Great, so now that we've perfected integral rules, we're actually gonna move on to something called definite integrals, which is changing our integral into a specific number by substituting in values. Now that might sound like a lot of gibberish to you, but let me try and explain. This is what we know so far, right? The integral of x squared with respect to x becomes x cubed over three, and that's due to the power rule. Now this is what we call an indefinite integral, okay? So I'm gonna say indefinite integral. That's the terminology that we use for just when we integrate a function and get another function back, okay? And the reason why it's called indefinite is because it's not happening over a certain x value. It's the same as if you have a function and you differentiated it, you can get a rule, but then you could also substitute in a number to get a rate of change. There's just more specific terms in integration compared to when we do differentiation. So the indefinite integral is literally just a rule, okay? So if you ever see the term indefinite integral, just think of the rule for the integral. Now, a definite integral comes from the fact that we substitute in numbers, but it's different to differentiation because for integration, we actually substitute in two. For differentiation, we only substitute in one. So integration, we substitute in two values. Now, how do we kind of deal with that? We always substitute in the top number and then minus the substitution of the bottom number. So these are called, I mean, the technical term, I've never heard any other student call it this, but it's called integrands. Okay, but you don't have to know that, you just think about it as the lower bound and the upper bound. So this is the lower bound, obviously because at the bottom, this one is the upper bound. So I'll just write upper, up there. Okay, so you substitute in the upper bound and then you minus the substitution of the bottom bound. Now, the most important thing to understand is how, obviously how we do it and the notation that we use. So the notation that we use is we use square brackets to denote what the indefinite integral is and then we write the top and the lower bounds. So what we do in this case is the integral of x squared we know becomes x cubed over three. So we put x cubed over three into the square brackets. Now we forget the plus c for now and I'll show you why at the end. And then at the end of these square brackets here we put negative two at the bottom, three at the top. Same as there but we just put on the outside on the right. Now, we substitute in the top bound minus the substitution of the bottom bound. So this becomes fairly straightforward. We get three cubed over three, and then you minus negative two cubed over three. And from here, it's just algebra. Three cubed is 27, divided by three is nine. Negative two cubed becomes negative eight because it's a negative to a power of an odd number. So multiplying an odd, a negative number three times keeps it negative. So it becomes minus and then negative two cubed, which is eight divided by three. Now I can combine these terms together. Nine becomes 27 on three. So 27 minus eight is 19 over three. Cool. Now, 19 over three is our definite integral. As I said before, we don't include the plus C because if we included a plus C here, what would happen? I may use a different color actually. If we include a plus c there, what would happen is we have plus c there, plus c there, and then when you minus this bracket from this bracket, the c's always cancel out anyway. So it doesn't matter what the constant is when you're doing integration or when you're doing definite integrals, the c's always cancel out. And even if you actually knew the c value, remember how I said that you can actually find the c value sometimes if you're given a coordinate or an extra piece of information? Even if you had one, for example, if it was three, if it was negative five, if it was 100, it wouldn't make a difference to our calculation anyway. So it doesn't matter what that is, you just ignore it whenever you're doing definite integrals. And just to reiterate, indefinite integral is the rule, this is the definite integral, and it's a value, okay? It's a value. Now, in the next topic, we're going to learn a couple of applications for integration, namely areas. Areas is the most common application for integration. Now, when you do that, you notice that when we calculate areas, you'll notice in the future, sorry, that you use unit squared as the unit when you calculate areas. So for example, if you find the area is five, you write five unit squared. It's really good practice and you're probably not gonna get full marks if you don't include uh, the unit squared as a part of your answer. Now, the reason why I mention that now is a lot of people would then go back in time and calculate definite integrals and they're gonna write unit squared here, especially if you've already done integration before and let's say um, you've done it in specialist maths or something like that. A lot of people would calculate definite integrals like this and then write nine, 19 over three unit squared. Now that's actually not 
That's not correct because this is not specifically asking for an area. This is just saying to calculate the integral from negative 2 to 3 or the definite integral from negative 2 to 3. So it's actually not correct if you write unit squared when you're not specifically calculating the area. And I just wanted to kind of separate that out into you know, two separate ideas before we move on to area and before we start kind of confuse them and kind of blur those two topics together.